I just came up with a one sentence version of my presentation and it's as follows. Please go and do everything that Bishop F has just said and I mean it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your words, encouragement, story, humor. Really appreciate it. You know, in this line of work that we're all in, it's very likely that some of us may be heading toward burnout. It's very likely that there are some of us here that might be in the middle of this. It's very likely that some of us are recovering from it. And I also had this joke that if you don't know this, then you're probably just in denial. <laughs> and my mentor told me I should cross that, but hell, I mean, well, so we just, we just sometimes go with it. So. Uh, that was well, by the way. Um, English is not my first language, it's not my second language, so um, that's an excuse I'll use probably more than once today. I do want to share my story, and uh, I wish it was a more fun story, but it probably can be developed in a, f I say, one season TV series. I don't think that anyone would pick that up, but it could be. But I'll just give you a very short five minute trailer. I felt that God called me to f ministry when I was 14. It was very short after the Soviet Union collapsed. Then, and it put me on a certain track. Actually, this year is a special year because in August, in summer, it was 20th anniversary since I started in full-time Christian work. And I can say that this is the best thing that happened to me, one of the best things that happened to me. And it's also one of the most difficult things that happened to me. And a little over than three years ago, I was standing on this very stage and observing and rejoicing in an amazing, amazing move of God here in this very room. It was incredible and just dreams come true. Just talk about dreams come true. Then a little less than a year later, I was standing in line in, in, line in the Gatwick airport in the UK. I know I will not hear cheering from the UK. That's not the airport you usually cheer. But so I'm standing there in line and I suddenly catch myself thinking, I wish the passport control people would not let me into the country. You know, the strange part was that I was heading toward a week full of exciting and important meetings, so that thought came as a big surprise. I never before was dreaming about being deported or not let into a country. Then fast forward another several months, I'm in California, in Monterey, in an ambulance, going to a hospital after what I thought, and not just I thought, was a near-death experience. And as, you, as many of you know, to call an ambulance in the US, you need to make a fairly strong case. And that was scary. It gave me a pause. The bill from the hospital almost gave me an actual heart attack. And, and I thought that I did all of the right things. I took three months sabbatical. I slowed down. I love mountains. So I went with my family to the mountains. We hiked as much as we could. And at the end of the sabbatical, I thought I'm good to go, so I just picked it up and moved on. And a few months later, I realized that those were just band-aids. We were in India, many of you were there in a great, another great gathering of WWO leadership team. I had another attack, and then after that, another one. There was another ambulance, another hospital. I came home, attacks continued. One day, the other for about a couple of weeks. And that time started a heroin and a lawn and a deep valley. I wish it was shorter, but it was very long. And I can tell that's the part when I don't have time to explain. I, I hope that most of you don't know and most of you don't need to know. But every single day I struggled with anxiety. I struggled with all kinds of physical symptoms. I, and and there, were, there was a lot of stuff that I wish I never knew. For the first time in many years, I was beginning to think, is this it? In May of last year, my wife and I, we prayed, and we felt that I should step aside from all ministry responsibilities, which I did. And, and that, was, that was strange, if you remember the calling that I shared back when I was 14. I tried everything on this journey. I realized that I don't like the way this thing stands. So I tried everything on that journey, medication, therapy, mentoring, memorization of Bible passages, prayers, you name it, I tried it. And usually at this point, some people would say nothing worked. <laughs> it 
It just somehow sounds good or appropriate. But I would say everything worked to some degree. But there was no magic cure, no magic solution. Unfortunately, I cannot point to a specific counselor or to a specific medication or even to a specific Bible verse, although God may give it to you, that if you do that, you'll be completely free from all of the anxieties and burnouts and all of the difficulties that you're going through. But God is faithful. I'm so grateful for people that God put into my life. Anya, first of all, thank you so much. For my mentor, Tom. For other people that have been praying, they've been working alongside and just helping me to go through this, through this journey. I'm still, rec I, by the way, I also learned a lot about healthcare system in a number of countries of the world. I realize, so if anyone needs advice, US, Singapore, India, Ukraine, of course, I can give a lot of helpful tits, tips that I hope you won't need ever. I'm still recovering. I'm still learning my lessons. I'm still asking myself a question, God, could have there been a different way? Could I have avoided it or prevented it? And honestly, I don't know. Probably yes, maybe no. And honestly, it's not such an important question for me anymore. The question that is important for me now is God, or what I'm asking God now is, please do everything that you intended to do in me during this time. Because God is always faithful. He's always there. He's really good. He is amazing. And sometimes, somehow, we learn most about it in some of the in rather difficult situations or difficult circumstances of our life. I wish there was a different way, but sometimes it often think that's what it takes. At least me, I'm hard-headed. I'm quite a stubborn guy. So apparently, there is a lot of special effects that needs to happen for me to learn some things. So what will follow now in the remaining time will not be a six-step guide toward preventing burnout. Or it will not be a five-step manual to overcoming or recovering from burnout. I'm not saying these are bad ideas. But what I will share will be slightly different and hopefully may lead to some of those other things. So I want to start with simple foundational truths that I'm still learning, but I think are the very key. Like there, was, there should have been a slide about magic recipe. It's still there. Actually, my family picture would have been great at this point. But you had enough time to read that there is no magic recipe. So this is not a magic recipe, but I truly believe that this is the foundation. Not my family, though, the foundation. But I, just, I hope that that's what you will be looking at for like five minutes, but I realized too late. So anyway, just a few more minutes. This is my family. That's the, that, these are the people that God used most to carry me through this season and to still carry me forward. And I'm just amazingly grateful to God for Anya, who is here with me. She couldn't come the last time because first time we had forum because we were just expecting our youngest baby. So I'm really happy that she's here today. And if you have her thinking, should I take my spouse with me anywhere? The, question, the answer is yes to that question. So just don't even think too much about this. OK, so there are two passages that I believe are very foundational when it comes to living refreshed. And actually, it's two stories. It's not just two passages. So one story is when Jesus was just starting his ministry. He was water baptized, and then he heard these words from his father in heaven. And the words were, you are my son, with you I'm well pleased. There are many different ways to say these words. Another way can be, I love you, I like you, I'm happy about you, just uh, I experience satisfaction with you. And I think each of us, if you're honest, these are the words we would like to hear from a father, from our father, or from anyone for that matter. And then there was another situation when Jesus said something which I believe was also directed toward his father. And that's the next passage we're going to read. And the words were that the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. I believe these two passages or these two stories from Jesus' life represent the foundation of living refreshed. The foundation of our life. When it's always start, it always starts with God saying to us. And if you are following Christ, this is the word, these are the words that he is saying to you. It was not just recorded in history about an episode from the life of Jesus. These are the actual words that God the Father is saying to each and everyone here in this room, if you are following him. 
that you are my son or you are my daughter and I'm pleased with you. I love you and I'm pleased with you. Amen. Amen. These are the words. And the hard part of this is that it's easy to receive those words intellectually or theologically. It's very hard to receive those words so deep that our life is actually flowing out of those words. Because in, sen- in essence, that's who God is for each of us, and that's who we are in him. And when we, the more we, the better we embrace those words, the more we are able they to say, then to say and do that Lord or anyone, there is nothing I can do by myself. That's a hard truth to get, but that's a reality. We think, it's easy for us to think that there are things we can do by ourselves, but in reality there isn't. There is nothing I can do by myself. The only good idea that I can come up with is to watch around, to listen closely, and to get some understanding of what it is that God is doing, and then join him in this work. And our life is essentially every day struggle to move toward closer to this reality, to this truth. You're maybe asking, I, I imagine this is a continuum, so what I've just described is on one side of the continuum. That's what Jesus perfectly exemplified. That's how he lived. Not just said, but how he lived. What's on the other side of the continuum is our ego. Our selfish ego that wants to do its own ambitions, that wants to do what, what's pleasing to other people sometimes or what impresses other people. And the irony is that often even the acts of service are done on this side of the continuum. We might be serving people, while at the same time what we are really doing is feeding our ego and feeding our selfish selfish ambition. So often only God knows, and that's not just a saying, that's that's a reality, only often, often only God knows what is really happening in this specific situation or in this specific interaction because he knows the hearts. And he knows if it's a heart that embraces the reality of you're my son or you're my daughter and I'm pleased with you. And God said that before Jesus did anything significant. And that heart responds, there is nothing I can do, but I watch what you're doing and I follow you. Or this is the heart that just do whatever it wants. And sometimes our heart wants to do nice things that people like and people get help from and so on. So this is the foundation. I want to say, before we move to the last part, I want to say one more thing that is very fitting for this context. As I was reflecting on these passages and on my own life story, and I think many of you will know immediately what I'm talking about, the children and then adults who grew up with abandonment, with rejection, being orphaned, whatever were the circumstances, it's a really, really hard journey for them to embrace the words that God is saying to them. Is that true? Can we resonate to this? It's hard, by the way, it's hard for anyone. I'm not saying it's easy for others, but if you happen to have loving parents who've been saying you these words, confirming them with actions, when you say that God, the maker of the universe, loves you and accepts you, it just makes it a little easier to embrace this reality and to really believe in it. And when you never heard this from anyone, it's really, really hard to embrace it. And then our life becomes this perpetual circle, circle or, or striving to achieve, to perform, to get something done that will fill this void that will never get filled. Because there is only one way, and it's a very simple way, but it's a very hard way to embrace. That I love you, you are my son, you are my daughter, and this is enough. Now, there are three takeaways that I would like us to leave from this, when you don't have to leave right after I say this, but whenever we leave, these are the three things that I think I hope will be practical. And in any sermon, if you've ever been in any kind of seminar, they teach you that there should be three points. So I have a few more minutes for my three points, so here they are. The first point is God cares about who you are more than about what you do. God cares about who you are more about what you do. And this is one of those things that when we hear, they're like, yeah, say, yeah, that's right. It's like global warming. Yeah, that's right, but we don't really believe it. That was not. <laughs> because it takes, it, it's, a hard, it's a hard truth to embrace. 
And the reason is because we are so committed to action, we so, most of us so much like to get things done that sometimes it's, it creates what is called cognitive dissonance in our head. How can it be so? And here is what I've discovered as I was learning about this, trying to, because that's, that's been a huge disconnect in my head, how it can be. Does it mean that God doesn't care about what I do? Does it mean that I, since God loves me, I can go and do whatever I want? So here's what I realized from God's perspective. It's always a good idea to look at things from God's perspective. We cannot really do it too well, but we can try to ask ourselves, how does God think about this? So from God's perspective, unless I or you are close to him, we will never know what he actually wants us to do. So God being a pragmatic God, that's what I believe, he tells us that unless, if you want to do anything meaningful in your life, then you better be very close to me. And if you're close to me, then you know that I love you, I care for you, but because I love and I care for you, I want you to go and do some things. And some of those might be difficult things. Do you see the connection here? There is no way around it. We cannot come to God with our accomplishments and say, hey, look what we've done, love us or give us this or that. But we can come to him and say thank you for loving me, for accepting me, and help me to see what is it that you are doing so that I can join in you. Then second part, second thing is, God wants you to take care of yourself. That actually comes across easier, because most of us have ego that has no problem with the idea of taking care of ourselves. It's actually some of us like, what's the, what's the big deal here, because most of, many of us grew up in environments we actually needed to get away from this idea, like don't treat yourself too well, like don't think about yourself. There is a big difference between thinking about yourself too much, being an egoistic person, and in a truly godly manner, caring for yourself. And then there can be a whole seminar, many seminars I don't have and will not do it now, but I'll just list a few things that I think we should be mindful about. We should care about what we eat, we should care about where we go, we should care about exercises. I actually have a list that I wrote down to make sure that I will not miss anything important. Physical exercises, how you rest, who you hang out with, and there is a lot. So the point I'm trying to make is there is a lot that you and I need to do to, care, to take a good care of ourselves. It's almost like a science on its own. And here is why we all heard and we know that God wants us to be a sacrifice, a living sacrifice, right? Reading Old Testament, I realized that God wants this sacrifice to be in a good shape. So we need to take a good care of ourselves so we will be a sacrifice that in good spiritual, physical, and emotional shape. Not the kind of sacrifice that would die on its own on the way to altar anyway. And the third, last point, is that God wants you and me to bear lasting fruit. That's his long game. That's his long-term plan. He wants for us to experience and see and bear fruit that means something in the long run. And here is the difficult part of this idea of making fruit that, or producing fruit that lasts. And it's... <laughs> I'm still, uh, that's something I'm still processing. So for many years, my image of a fruit was a grape. I should have brought this myself, but we've seen these very nice grapes and just like really cool to look at it. Here is the challenge with grapes, that grapes don't last. What happens with grapes like in a few days? They wither, they just, they rot, and they're gone. In order for grape wine to bear lasting fruit, what, what needs to happen to the grapes? they need to be crushed. And when they are crushed, they produce wine. And wine is the lasting fruit that comes out of the grapes. So the hard reality is here that not every crushing, not every suffering bears lasting fruit. But there is no lasting fruit. There is no way we can produce lasting fruit without suffering or without crushing. I wish there was a different way, but there isn't. It's a joy. It can, there can be joy there. There can be a lot of good things, but it's still going to be hard. So I po I've chose two pictures. One is show It's actually one of the nicer pictures about crush. And most of the pictures I found were like X-rated, and <laughs> you're not allowed to show them in public because they're really messy. 
but this is one of the simpler ones. But there is nothing really nice about this picture. That's how grapes look when they're crushed. That's how often our lives look when they're crushed. But then when we go to the next slide, we see the vine. I know that many of us, there are many church cultures, so many of us, this is almost like a sin, picture of sin. So forgive me for that if you're coming from that theological framework. I know it doesn't really fit well, but it still fits well with the biblical message here. And the message here is that God wants us to produce lasting fruit that matters in eternity, and there is no way we can do it without some kind of crushing. But the best part of this news is that God is there. And he will put people into your life that he will use to help you go through that season and rejoice with you when they will see the fruit that God has bared through you. Thank you so much, and God bless you.